So between 1492 and 1502, Christopher Columbus led four expeditions uh, off to search for a water passage to the Far East. And each time he came back to Spain more confident that he had in fact uh, been exploring the Far East. And some other explorers uh, doubted some of his claims, but despite it, this idea of the water passage really held people's imagination. And uh, in 1524, Giovanni de Verrazzano also sailed off in search of this water passage. And it was a great, glorious day for him when he announced he had actually found it. Um, but if he would have sailed a bit further down this water passage, he would not find the Bay of Bengal, but instead uh, present day Baltimore, Delaware, and Harrisburg, PA, because he was standing at the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. Now, Consider for a moment the Great Smoky Mountains, the arches of Utah, the Great Plains, the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. For those first explorers looking for the passage east, these, these great monuments to nature that have inspired Americans and people all over the world were nothing but a barrier to where they wanted to go, a barrier to their own utopia, a blockage, an evil hindrance. So a few years ago, I was working at a coffee shop in Brooklyn and working as a freelance writer, and I mostly wrote about music. Uh, soon after starting to work at the coffee shop, I realized that a lot of the most hyped and popular bands coming out of the Brooklyn music scene actually were regular customers there. And soon after that, I was surprised to notice that they didn't seem to have very much money. Um, now, I was surprised because I saw how much media coverage they were receiving. I knew they were selling out shows. Uh, I also knew they were playing on national broadcast television. But then I remembered that nobody I knew paid for music anymore. Uh, and my generation really popularized this idea that uh, it was now optional whether or not you wanted to pay for music. And you know, we used Napster and then a bunch of other services that, that followed from it. Uh, we had a lot of excuses for, for why this was why this was fine, uh, that real artists didn't really care about making money, or that it was really just promotion, and that actually this was going to help artists if we, if we took all of their music, um, or that we weren't stealing anything because, you know, if, if otherwise we, we wouldn't have bought it anyway. Now, I knew at the time that these were all just pretty lazy excuses um, meant to justify this free-for-all, but I didn't engage in the conversation. Uh, back then. I figured that over time, the situation and the problem would just work itself out. That was back in 2001, 2002. Fast forward to 2009, so I'm back in Brooklyn working at the coffee shop, and it's, the things are pretty much the same. Nobody's paying for music. Uh, revenues from recorded music have been halved. And now that I know some of these artists, um, I understand that you know these people I put on a pedestal were, were really just working people. So I started thinking more about piracy and, and, and this situation that had developed, thinking it was kind of dark. Um, and eventually I, I wrote a book about it called Freeloading. Uh, as I began to research this book, soon I realized that when I was talking about artists getting paid and all of these websites based overseas, what I was, the terrain I was really on was, was one of copyright, the exclusive right of creators <clears throat> to decide who gets to make copies of their work. The first great law of copyright was the Statute of Anne in 1710, passed by uh, the British Parliament. The situation back then uh, was one of books, so authors' work was being reprinted and sold without their consent by publishers and booksellers. So, uh, and that was being done too often to the ruin of them and their families, so the law was passed in order to counter this and also to encourage learned men to compose and write useful books, giving them some legal recourse if someone was trying to rip them off. Uh, since that time, copyright has expanded to a global institution. Um, it covers music and television and film, pretty much any artwork that can be reproduced. And also the original copyright term of 28 years has now expanded to the lifetime of the author plus an additional 70 years. So, um, you know, copyright's not perfect. No institution is perfect. Um, and I actually think copyright terms, for one, are, are longer than they should be. But for contemporary works, it basically is serving the same purpose that it always did, preventing people from casually ripping off artists for their work um, and making sure the modern equivalent of those booksellers um, can't just get away with it. So as I continued to research 
the book, I started coming across these um, utopian sentiments from people uh, in the internet community uh, who really saw the internet as you know, this wonderful thing that's, 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 that was going to liberate us. Kevin Kelly, he uh, used to be the editor of Wired magazine, and as you see, he wrote, a recurring vision swirls in the shared mind of the net of wiring human and artificial minds into one planetary soul. So that's you know, a pretty exciting prospect out there. Um, and this really echoed the sentiments of Stuart Brand, who said uh, that information wants to be free. So you know, this sensibility starts to develop that the whole point of the internet is to liberate the information, free it up so we can you know, build this new consciousness, essentially. Uh, Cory Doctorow, who is an activist and a science fiction writer, said that making bits that were harder to copy was like having water that's less wet, that you know, the internet was really just a giant, infinite copying machine. And, um, and you know, it wasn't just a case of copyright not being applied to the internet. It was actually something that was going to fight the technology itself. It was something that was going to keep us from progress. John Perry Barlow was another person who entered into this discussion. Uh, he actually used to be the songwriter for the Grateful Dead, and he founded the Electronic Frontier Foundation. He wrote this manifesto, the Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace, back in the 90s in Davos, Switzerland. The takeaway being that uh, copyright is really this tool of the past that was trying to hold back the future. Um, and, you know, yeah, he saw the internet as representing this passageway of progress, this destiny of progress for humanity, and laws and rules of the past were just blockages that were going to keep us from achieving this destiny. Uh, in other words, copyright was a barrier fundamentally. It was going to keep us from achieving human progress in the information age. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with sharing information. I mean, if an artist wants to put their work out there for free, that's their right. And it's a wonderful thing that it's so easy to do now. It wasn't as easy to do before. Um, and I also think digital distribution, by the same turn, is revolutionary. It's great. But I think a lot of the thinkers from the information, from the internet community, sort of glossed over the nature of consent because, in sharing, because you know, if you're an artist who maybe you don't want your information and your work to just be out there everywhere, maybe you want to try to make some money off of your recordings. Their basic answer to them is too bad, because that's not what the internet wants, and that's not what information wants, uh, which I find to be a somewhat condescending reaction. Uh, but they also, you know along with consent, they gloss over the fact that, you know, they talked about this being free information, but profits are being made left and right online. Um, the internet started with public funding. It was a way for scientists to share information with one another. But in the 1990s, that shifted. Uh, they handed the internet back, control of the internet backbone over to internet service providers like Time Warner and Comcast private companies. So the internet that we all understand, the rise of technology we've experienced, that's been a commercial internet, uh, one based on proprietary access and code, uh, patents, and of course, as we all know, lots and lots of advertising. So billions of dollars are being made on this platform. ISPs are making billions. This year, Google is poised to bring in uh, over $60 billion in revenue for the second straight year. So, you know, when we're talking about free information or sharing, what, what does that really mean? If I'm going online and I'm looking for a free album or film to download or stream, what's actually happening is the ISP is making money. The search engine, be it Google or someone else, they're making money off of advertising and keyword searches. And then, of course, the pirate site, they have advertising on their sites. So what all this really means is that everyone gets paid except for the creator. Now, uh, Despite the fact that in the United States, um, Napster and Grokster and LimeWire, all file sharing services, have be, been ruled in the courts um, to not be viable business models because of what I've described, the way they treat creators for their work, whenever there are attempts to deal with the global situation, because there are offshore sites that can still easily get to US customers, people from the open internet community, the you know, same one I've been describing, they say, you can't do that because you're, gonna, you're defeating openness. You're, again, you're violating what the internet is supposed to be, and you're trying to censor the internet. 
A couple of years ago, a law called the Stop Online Piracy Act was proposed in the United States, which was trying to deal with this situation. And when it was proposed, Eric Schmidt of Google said, so, you know, let's whack off uh, the domain name. This is his counter argument. Okay, that seems like an appealing solution, but it sets a very bad precedent because now another country will say, I don't like free speech, so I'll whack off all those domain names. That country would be China. It's interesting because he's not saying that it's wrong to, you know, go after these pirate sites, but he's, he's sort of shifting your, your focus, the rhetorical focus of it, saying, oh, this is going to lead to worse things down the road. But this is really just fear-mongering because China, Iran, and North Korea don't need copyright as an excuse to censor their citizens. They just go ahead and they do it because that's the type of government and society uh, that they run, unfortunately. So, you know, looking at this chorus that always springs up when people try to enforce copyright, that it naturally is going to be censoring people, that's really um, just this cynical ploy, and it uses free speech, something we all respect, only as a way to further the exploitation of artists. Um, now, the fact of the matter is, these sites are making an awful lot of money. The Digital Citizens Alliance did a report uh, this past year, and they said in 2013, pirate sites around the world took in about $250 million in revenues. The largest 30 sites took in on average $4.4 million. Even the smallest sites were bringing in $100,000, which is a lot more than most artists can hope to make in a year. They were operating at profit margins of 80 to 94 percent. So, you know, you can, we can talk about these flowery ideas of you know, opening up information and freeing all of our information. But at the end of the day, with piracy, you're just talking about a big black market. That's what it is. And it's a huge market. Um, some other studies have come out this year that have placed the total amount of users looking for infringing content at over 400 million around the world. In 2011, the US Chamber of Comber Commerce um, studied this issue. And they found that um, the total amount of visits per month to pirate sites equated to 56 billion. That's just 56 billion per month. So, you know, again, there's this flowery language, utopian language, about free the freedom of information. But at the end of the day, what about the people who actually run these sites? What do they say about it? I don't care. That's the big thing. I don't care. If I want it, I take it because I can. This is the spokesman, former spokesman of the Pirate Bay, one of the most notorious and popular sites uh, that trades in unlicensed content. So this is really an unfortunate situation because now there are actually legitimate services that are emerging online like Spotify, but because of the black market, artists can't hope to negotiate fair rates for their work on those services. Um, in addition, the actual serve potential to find new ways and distribution methods, licensed ones for artwork, they have a hard time getting off the ground because, again, they're competing with this huge black market. In that sense, um, you know, the, the potential of the internet is not being met uh, in the sense that uh, the, the potential for shared prosperity among artists and also digital services, but also uh, the fact that you know, we could be expanding consciousness, but artists are getting a short shift. Now, my, my, you know, some, coming from someone who values creativity, and I think that's, you know, it's a wonderful thing, and that's sort of the whole point, um, to me, the internet today is broken. So, what do we do about it? I mean, one thing is to notice that something is sort of amiss about what's, what's happening. Technology was supposed to liberate us, but let's just notice for a second how the world looks today and amidst the popularization of the internet. You have greater divisions in society. You have rising inequality. Uh, you also have greater political polarization and, you all, and paralysis in government. Remember, this was supposed to be the tool that was going to help us communicate better. Um, so something seems awfully wrong. And we can return to Kevin Kelly talking about the planetary soul, and you know, that's, that's nice to think about. I think he puts too much faith in technology, but I actually share his optimism still that we can use the internet uh, to achieve human potential and progress and maybe even evolve. So copyright is not the great hindrance and barrier to achieving progress in the information age. In fact, it's the opposite, I believe. What we need to do is 
harness digital distribution and look for ways that we can use the internet to incentivize creativity in better ways than we ever have in the past. That is the terrain that we are destined to explore. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of, you know, I was speaking about the divisions earlier and um, I was surprised this week uh, reading about Ferguson, Missouri, David Brooks from the New York Times actually wrote about the potential of art to unite us, to transcend our divisions. And he wrote that, you know, when we're dealing with these deep-seated issues, conversation can help, though I suspect novels, works of art, and books work better. Consciousness isn't raised by endless streams of 140 character missives. Uh, it's by artists, I would argue, who can bring us together and show us paths to the future that, that we haven't considered before. And also, when we give artists economic uh, strength and independence, that makes them more able to pursue their own goals. It gives them creative freedom, and they can even swerve the trajectory of human culture. Think about Bob Dylan or Nina Simone or Philip Roth or Stanley Kubrick. Um, you know, today, what we need are also journalists and essayists that can wake us up to the world as it is and, um, and do away with some outmoded ideas that are still out there. But all of this requires uh, rectifying copyright and figuring out the best way to use it and marry it with distri di digital distribution. So long past the days of Columbus and Verrazano, Lewis and Clark set out to explore the wonders of the interior of the place that those old explorers just saw as a barrier. And Meriwether Lewis wrote about the Missouri. This immense river waters one of the fairest portions of the globe, nor do I believe that there is in the universe a similar extent of country. As we passed on, it seemed those scenes of visionary enchantment would never end. So I would argue that the challenge that we face today is to harness copyright and to go on to explore the frontier, use it to explore the frontiers of human creativity. And you know, if we can get that right, we can have the level of creative culture, a diverse creative culture, an independent creative culture um, that the world simply has never seen before. And that is gonna bring us into the, uh, the world of new and expanded consciousness. Um, and if we can do that, the enchantment of human creativity will never have an end. Thank you. <laughs>